Good morning. I'm Reverend Elliot Robinson. I'm the pastor of Nimno AME Church, and I want to welcome you to our virtual worship service. I want to thank you for taking the time to come and join with us, commune with us, fellowship with us as we attempt to grow closer to God and to know better what God has in store for us, for our lives, for our families, for our communities, and for the world. As you can see behind me, we have our purple backdrop as we continue to bring awareness to Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Some years ago, my grandmother passed away from Alzheimer's, and so I know the impact that that disease has on the individual and also on the family. But we know that even in those difficult times, as our faith is challenged as the one that we love, doesn't know us in the same way, doesn't remember in the same way, and doesn't connect with us in the same way, we are also given assurance that on a much different level, a much higher level, on a deeper and more spiritual level, that there is still that connection. And so we always ask God to help us get through what was lost and remember what we still have. And so just want to remind others, if you know someone who is dealing with Alzheimer's or you have a friend who has a family member that is dealing with Alzheimer's, ask God how God can use you to step in and to be a comfort, to be a listening ear, to be a helper or a support as they go through that difficult time. Again, thank you for joining us this morning. And so we will call the community together in our time and our call to worship as we ask God to meet us right here in this place of worship with one another. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. Lord, I have loved thy habitation, the place where thy honor dwelleth. For the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. O sing unto the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth, and sing praises. I ask that you now join me in prayer as we lift up prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of comfort, prayers of healing, asking God to do what only God can do, not just for us, but for those whom we love, those whom we may have never even met before, but that God's grace, mercy, healing, and power can be released in the world to make this world a better place. Lord, we come before you this morning, O God, asking you, O Lord, pleading with you, O God, entreating upon you, O Lord, to release, O God, in this earth, in this world, in this place, O God, your spirit, O God, of love, your spirit of kindness, your spirit of grace and mercy. Lord, we ask, O God, that you live up, O God, those, O Lord, who have lost loved ones that they may be comforted by you, O Lord, that they may feel you close to them, O God. Lord, we lift up those, O God, who have gotten a bad diagnosis, O God, that you would be beside them, O Lord, knowing, O God, that in it and through it, O Lord, you are there. You are with them at every doctor's visit, O God. You are with them, O God, after the surgery, O Lord. You are with them, O God, through recovery, O God. You are with them, O God, in the rehab facility, O Lord. You're with them, O oh God, in the nursing home, O oh God. Lord, that wherever they are, you are there with them. You would never leave them nor forsake them. Lord, we pray right now, O oh God, for all the prayer requests that went up this past week, O oh God. The prayer requests that are going up even now, Lord. That you will, O oh God, be there to hold them. To look at each one, O oh God. And meet us in our place of want and in our place of need in our place of anguish, in our place of desperation, in our place of triumph, in our place of worry. Lord, that you might meet us there and remind us that there's nothing too hard for you, nothing too big for you, nothing too small for you, because what concerns us concerns you. Lord, right now, O oh God, we lift up, O oh God, praise reports for all the ways, O oh God, that you reminded us, O oh God, 
that you're with us. We lift up, O oh God, right now, Lord, prayers of praise, O oh God, for all the things that you've done for those whom we love, those who thought that you'd forgotten, those who were in doubt, where, O oh God, you just turned their situation around, increased their favor, allowed grace and mercy to have its way. Lord, we thank you and give you praise. We thank you, O oh God, for being able to come together one more time, O oh God, in your name. That last night our bed was not our cooling board, O oh God, and that you gave us a portion of our right mind, activity of our limbs, O oh God. Lord, that you provided us with this time to come together, to unburden ourselves, to lift you up, to glorify you, to magnify your holy name. Lord, we say thank you, praying that your Holy Spirit will move, shake loose those things, O oh God, that are holding us down. And allow us, O oh God, to open our mouths and sing praises unto your holy name. Lord, we pray that the word that comes forth is none of me and all of you. That you and you alone would be glorified and that we might be edified. We thank you in advance, O oh God, for what will come from this worship experience, O oh God. That we will be changed and drawn closer to you. We pray, O oh Lord that you will just continue to move in this earth. Have your way, O oh Lord. Have your way, O oh Lord. We thank you in advance for what you will do. We thank you for what you are doing even now. And we show enough thank you for what you have done before that you can and you will do it again. It is in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, that we pray and give thanks. Let all God's children say amen, amen, and amen. When I went to prison, I left behind um, my girlfriend at the time and our then two-year-old daughter. I didn't know who to ask to help. Um, and then Angela started attending a, a local church that, uh, that was involved with prison fellowship programming, right? Yeah, and Angel Tree from Prison Fellowship came in and uh, was able to offer him a gift to uh, send to our daughter. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Yeah. Because what it, it did for me is it let me stay connected with our daughter. It, it provided a way for, for me to stay connected with their life. Um, I would say one great thing about Angel Tree is just the relationship that it allows the incarcerated person and their child to have. Um, growing up, I always got Christmas presents from my dad. I still remember getting the pink pajamas and the Madagascar DVD. Um, and so those are just very special memories that I have to my heart. Through Angel Tree, I also got to go to summer camp, which was a really awesome experience. And I feel really lucky to be in my 20s and talk to my friends about my experiences at camp and just really realizing that I got to have a pretty normal childhood in some aspects even though there was a large part of my childhood that was missing. So now that we've planted this church, um, for us, yes. what's important is that we... Over 150 kids now receive yeah. presents from Angel Tree too and as an adult myself now I really enjoy the opportunity to participate in Angel Tree. Our church does it every year and it's really great getting to see the kids and the smiles that they have and even the um, congregation and just the joy that they have serving that part of the community. What was a, a tragedy in the beginning became a blessing mm. and it's really worked for our community and so we just we're so excited and blessed by Angel Tree. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we love it. We love Angel Tree. You guys should too. You've heard firsthand the power of the Angel Tree program. It means so much to those who are incarcerated and it means so much more to those who are waiting for them to come home, waiting for someone like you and like me to stand in the gap to serve as God's hands and God's feet in the world in a very real and tangible way. I had the opportunity to serve as an instructor at the Arendelle State Prison for Women here in Georgia. And let me tell you, maximum security prison for mothers, sisters, daughters. It is a challenging and difficult place. And it means so much to know 
that there are those who think enough of them to stand in the gap, to lend a help, helping hand, to extend beyond in ways that they cannot to show love to those whom they love. And so I'm asking you if you would love to help us by sponsoring one of the children that we'll be able blessing to this Christmas, it would be greatly appreciated. We're simply asking in order to sponsor a child for the Angel Tree program. You can make a donation of $50 or more that will allow us to be able to purchase at least two gifts per child so that we can be a blessing to someone else this Christmas. You can do that by giving through our website, nimnoamechurch.org, as well as through Cash App or Venmo at Nimno AME Church. I assure you, we will do everything that we can to ensure that those children get the gifts that they want and that they need, and that we're giving them on behalf of their loved one who is currently incarcerated. So please, join us in this effort that we can be a blessing to others. text this morning comes from Micah 6, 3 through 8. Micah 6, 3 through 8. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? And what have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam son of Bor answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the doing of the Holy Word. 
Lord, use me as a vessel for your message. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title of this sermon is Fear of a Black Pastor. Fear of a Black Pastor. I'd like you to listen to a clip from the Ahmed Aubrey trial, which is currently going on here in Georgia. The voice you hear will be that of Kevin Go. He's the defense attorney for one of Aubrey's killers. It's one thing for the family to be present. It's another thing to ask for the lawyers to be present. But if we're going to start a precedent starting yesterday, we're going to bring high profile members of the African American community into the courtroom to sit with the family during the trial in the presence of the jury. I believe that's intimidating and it's an attempt to pressure, could be consciously or unconsciously, an attempt to, to pressure or influence the jury. Obviously, there's only so many pastors they can have. And if that, their pastor's Al Sharpton right now, that's fine, but then that's it. We don't want any more black pastors coming in here or other, Jesse Jackson, whoever was in, was in here earlier this week, sitting with the victim's family, trying to influence a jury in this case. And I'm not saying the state is even aware that Mr. Sharpton was in the courtroom. I certainly wasn't aware of it till last night. But I think the court can understand my concern uh, about bringing people in who really don't have any ties to this case other than political interests. And, and we want to keep politics out of this case. If a bunch of folks came in here dressed like Colonel Sanders with white masks sitting in the back, I mean, that would be good. Okay, I'm, I'm Yes, that was the attorney for one of the killers of Ahmed Aubrey. You did not hear wrong. You were not hearing things. That is exactly what he said, is what you heard. So basically, Attorney Go decides that he would remove all doubt regarding his attempt to influence the jury with a statement that is vile on several levels. One of them is just old fashioned attorney trickery, the us against them outsider strategy. These folks coming in who aren't part of the community trying to impact our form of justice. He then also kind of takes the celebrity clergy angle with Sharpton and with Jesse Jackson. But at the heart of his recital, is simply this. We don't want any more black pastors in here. Not pastors, not just clergy, but specifically black pastors. Now it would be wonderful if a plethora of white clergy made their way down to Brunswick, Georgia, fully collared up and they sat with the family for the rest of the trial. That would be awesome. And it would actually turn his little argument on its head in some regards, since his concern is black pastors. But if I'm being honest, I doubt very seriously if too many pastors from that part of Georgia or Florida um, would take that chance, to be quite honest, of going to Brunswick, donning their clergy collar and sitting with the family every day. There are repercussions when you sit with black folks in the South on the side of justice. Prior to last year's racial awakening, there's been a glaring disconnect between far too many churches and the call for justice. And definitely a disconnect between white churches, white clergy, white congregations, and the cause of racial justice. As a black pastor, pastoring in the rural South, the words of attorney go struck a nerve. We don't want any more black pastors in here. While his admonition was centered around the trial, it's a sentiment that has been at home in America for centuries. We don't want any more black pastors in here. It's why black churches are often the place of attack during times of resistance to racism 
and racist systems. It's why black churches were burned in the struggle for civil rights. It's why they still burn black churches today. Since 1991, there have been over 50 churches burned, vandalized, or the recipients of racist violence. Even as recently as last year, Metropolitan AME Church in Washington, D.C. was vandalized by a white supremacist as a sign of resistance to the call for racial justice. We don't want any more black pastors in here. It's why black preachers, and pastors, congregants, clergy were also often targeted for violence in the Jim Crow South. But that targeting didn't end at the end of the Jim Crow era. It's why Reverend Clementa Pinckney, Reverend Daniel Simmons, Reverend DePayne Middleton Doctor, Sister Cynthia Hurd, Sister Susan Jackson, Sister Ethel Lance, Brother Tywanza Sanders, Sister Sharonda Singleton, Sister Myra Thompson. That's why they were all gunned down at Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina on June 17th, 2015. It's why a teenager planned and intended to replicate that same violence at Bethel AME Church Gainesville in Gainesville, Georgia on not one, but two separate occasions in 2019. She was only stopped because no one was at the church both times she attempted to go and bring about slaughter. What the planning perpetrator didn't know, however, was that the pastor of Bethel Amy Gainesville was retired military, and she probably would have met that, pep that perpetrator's force with equal and necessary force to save not only her life, but the life of her members. We don't want any more black pastors in here. Black folks are often burdened with this idea of saving the soul of America, always having to step in and redeem America before it goes off the deep end of unresponsive, unrepentant, unparalleled power shrouded in white supremacy and oppression. Always having to point America back to the ideals and the teachings of the biblical text. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Jesus loves the little children, unborn and even after they're born. Be like the Good Samaritan. Help someone in need. Treat those incarcerated with love and respect. Welcome the stranger and the immigrant. Provide food and shelter to those in need. Sometimes black pastors feel like they're just simply yelling in the wind, working against those of other houses of faith who are more aligned with politicians and political rhetoric than they are with Christ and Christianity. Black pastors spend so much time pushing against clergy and congregants who are perpetual naysayers, naysayers to equality naysayers to protecting children, naysayers to helping the less fortunate, unless it's through vacations masquerading as mission work, naysayers to both abolishing the prison industrial complex and restoring the humanity of those incarcerated, naysayers to treating immigrants with love and respect, naysayers to a theology of liberation against oppression. We don't want any 
more black pastors in here. Kevin Go, and those who think, feel, and believe like he does, place the presence of black pastors within the confines of those to be loathed, despised, and distrusted. In his little diatribe, he even placed black pastors within the same category as the Ku Klux Klan. He compared the imagery of individuals dressed in all white like Colonel Sanders while wearing masks, sitting in the rear of the courtroom in same proximity to black pastors. The notion perhaps that black pastors were as dangerous to whites as the Klan is as dangerous to blacks. A notion that is simply preposterous, yet he was very comfortable making it. Perhaps he was even being a little more devilish, sending out a clarion call that if the black pastors were welcome, why couldn't the Klan be welcome? What makes black pastors so dangerous? What is it about black pastors that is so dangerous? The reality is that the very bodies of black pastors to so many whites represents a site of resistance, just the presence of it, just the breathing, just the being of it. It invokes something that is antithetical to the wiles of white supremacy, the violence of racism, the oppression of its systems. They are the embodiment of what our text is requiring of all of us. The people in our text want to know, how can they cozy up to God? How to get in God's good graces? They pull out their familiar refrains. Shall I come before God with burnt offerings with a calf a year old? Translation, can I church myself into right relationship with God? Can church rituals help to relieve the stain of the way in which our society is that's hindering community? Can I stay the same, but go through the motions of faith? They go on to ask, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Translation, can I donate? Can I give? Can I tithe? Can I offering myself into right relationship with God? What donor level do I need to achieve? Can I sow a seed offering that holds me less accountable for the racist systems that are existing around me? Can I charity my way into being above reproach? The text goes on to say, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Translation. Okay, if this is really serious what I'm doing, then I'm willing to risk it all. This, this practice is a big deal in culture. So maybe if I do this in the church, maybe God will look on me favorably. If I make this massive sacrifice of myself, would that be enough for God? And yet, as these three examples are pondered, Lift it up. Ask as a way to be absolved from what's happening in community. What's happening in their lives. What's happening in how their faith and their works are not matching up. God responds this way through Micah. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? Justice. Mishpat in the Hebrew. Justice. Not giving. Not doing. But justice. Not offerings. Not working my fingers to the bone in the church. But justice. 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 The act the places, the lawsuits, the crime, the punishment, justice, scales balanced, justice, doing what's right, justice, 
something that is favorable in the eyes of God. Justice. Not based on how much money you have. Justice. Not based on who you know. Justice. Not based on how much money you don't have. But justice. That is what is important to God. Not systems that are turned upside down to favor those based on what they have, based on, based on who they know, or based on the complexion of their skin and what's associated with that. God wants justice. But God doesn't stop there. God says that not only is justice important, but guess what? I need you to love mercy. I don't just need you to like mercy. I don't need you to just be associated or affiliated with mercy from time to time. I need you to love mercy. Probably in part because God knows that each and every day we are giving mercy. We are given mercy. We are given grace. It's new and fresh every day. We need to love the act of mercy. We need to embrace it. We need to embody it. We need it to become a part of who we are. That without mercy, we would feel less than. Without mercy, we would feel as if a part of us is missing. God is requiring of us that our good deeds, that our favor, that our kindness, that our pity, that all of those things that make us look upon another with love be something that we love, that we love to do, that we love to give that we love to share, that we love mercy. But then yet God is not satisfied with those two pieces. God is asking that we also then walk humbly with God, not braggadociously, not boisterously, not in ways that we hold ourselves above others. Not that we think we're closer to God than someone else, but that we walk humbly with God. That we walk humbly with God. And that walking is not just walking one way, it's active. It means that sometimes we are carrying, sometimes we are bearing, sometimes we are bringing, sometimes we are flowing. In all of these actions, we are doing it humbly with God. God is requiring more of us. God is requiring more of the world. And I believe that there is fear of a black pastor because it is a constant reminder that God is not pleased with what's happening in the world. That that black pastor is a representation of what God is requiring in Micah for all of us. That nagging, that prophetic voice, that one that will simply not let it go because we have not yet lived up to the ideals that God has required of us. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Why is there so much fear of black pastors, but even more so black, black faith. Because I believe, as the world knows, we know something about what it means to endure and to have to hold on to a faith in the midst of the storm, in the midst of bondage, in the midst of denial, in the midst of what seems like an endless nightmare. God, can still be with us. God still sits with us. God still holds us close. And so our faith is real because God is real. God has been to us in those dark, dank, lonely places. 
when we felt like we were shut up. When we felt like we were in the lion's den. We felt like we were in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There was God with us also. No. Our Bible was not a tool to keep us down and enslaved. The Bible was the tool that gave us the strength to fight on, to endure, until we achieved. We took what man intended for evil and we found the good in it. That is why they fear a black pastor. That is why they fear the black church. That is why we will continue to fight and endure until God gets the last word. Because when we sit on the side of justice and we sit on the side of mercy and when we sit on the side of walking humbly with God, we are in good company because we are walking in alignment with what God has for us. No, silence is not an option. Oh, the attorney wanted to silence the representation of God in the church and the representation of God in, in, in the courtroom. Wants to silence the voice of justice. Wants to silence the voice of mercy. Wants to silence the very voice of what it means to walk with God. And yet we will endure. And yet we will fight. The hymn says, am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is their vile world a friend to grace to help me on to God? Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. I am a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb. You are a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb. So when they look at you and they say, we don't want any more black pastors in here, black faith in here, black church in here, turn and look at them and say, does the Lord require of me, but more importantly, of you, but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Don't let someone else's fear interfere with what God is calling you to do with what God is calling you to champion, with what God is calling you to tear down and build back up in God's name. No, it's not going to be easy. No one said that it would. No, it doesn't feel fair that we have to carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. No, it doesn't feel right that we have to save the soul of an America that oftentimes feel as if it is not appreciative of us even being here. But yet, the mission was strong enough, great enough, that God said, only you can do it. And so we fight and we endure. And we fight and we endure. And we will win because we sit on God's side not in some militaristic way, but in the way of the word. It's simple. Do justice. Love mercy. Walk humbly with our God. If you want to know what it means in the midst of a fear-filled world to be closer to God, to draw closer to God, to get strength from God, to know that when you do right, God sees you. And even if you do wrong, God has grace and mercy for you. 
All you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And simply confess your sins, and God is quick to forgive you of those sins. And you are a new creature in Christ. The old things that you've done are passed away. And now you live and move towards things that are new. Hmm. Fear of a black pastor. Fear of a black church. Fear of someone filled with enough faith to actually believe the word of God is good. It doesn't need systems of oppression. It doesn't require racism and sexism. That God has enough love in this world that we will all do better and we could all be better and we could all live in peace and in harmony if we but just trust that God. Don't give in to fear. Don't give in to hatred. Don't give in to the vile ways of this world, but simply lean on the word of God and it will truly set you free. Don't let fear of a black pastor keep you from being whom God has called you to be. Don't let your mantra be, we don't want any more black pastors in here. Instead, let it be. Come, all ye who are faithful. Come, all you who love God. Come, all you who seek to live out God's commandment. And join with me in being God's hands and God's feet in the world. Let that be your mantra. Let that be your North Star. Let that be your guiding light. Because without justice and without mercy and without walking humbly with God, you are far from God and God does not know you. Don't be afraid. Walk in love with one another. Fear of a black pastor. If you didn't know, now you know. It is very real and it is an occupational hazard, if you will, of being called to the ministry of God, imbued with this skin. But we know that we serve a God that is good, faithful, true, and just. And so for many black pastors, that is the thing that keeps us going. Even when it feels as if there are times when we just want to give up. We know that God is on our side because we are on God's side. Now it's time for our benediction. Now to the one that is able to keep us from falling, to present us faultless before the throne with exceeding joy, to the all wise, God our creator, Christ our redeemer, and the Holy Spirit our comforter, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, now, henceforth, and forevermore. Let all God's children say amen, amen, and amen. I love you. God loves you. And there is nothing you can do about it. Until next Sunday, take care. God bless. Be safe. I love you.